glory and the honor in Jesus' name. God's people said, amen, amen and amen. Those rusty nails. You now, when you turn to Psalm 22 and verse 16, this is a prophecy that went some thousand years before that literally took place. Psalm 22 and verse 16. And towards the end, they pierced my hands and my feet. They pierced my hand and my, my hands and my feet. This was spoken so many years. And I want to recognize what it means. And again, Isaiah, several years, 700 years before, speaks about again how the nail matters when you turn to Isaiah chapter 22 and verse 23, just towards the later part. It goes on to say, the first part, I will fasten him as a nail in a sure place, and he shall be for glorious throne to his father's house. The whole chapter is amazing, talks about a literal person, and yet talking to the far time when Jesus Christ would have the key of David, and he would basically bring about uh, salvation because of his father's throne. I want you to understand, when we're talking about nail to a sure foundation, we need to realize that it's because of what the Lord Jesus Christ went through in his crucifixion we find such a surety of uh, salvation and deliverance and healing and to become part we prayed about into the family of God and to have a rich relationship with our eternal God. I want to realize what it means in terms of what the psalmist is talking about and also what Isaiah is talking about, the nail. Think in terms of the nail that was used to nail the Lord Jesus Christ on that tree. It was specifically three, one on his right hand, one on his uh, left hand, and then again on his feet, they were pierced. And then of course there was a spear that uh, pierced into his side. What we find is so meaningful when we think about why. Why did the Lord have to go through all of this? It's a simple story of what would be, why Lord? if Adam could ever say that I was thrown out of the Garden of Eden. It's simply because he ate not just any tree, but the good of, of the knowledge of good and evil. And God in his love and his grace had to do what he had to do because here was the first man and woman broken up, their life broken because of disobedience. Of all things, that tree the Lord said not to touch was the very tree that reached out, they touched, they ate, and simply bringing brokenness, a broken relationship, their lives were broken. And if God could reply, he would simply say, it's because I don't want you to be permanently broken. In your own life, in your own personality, and in a broken relationship with me, I had to do what I had to do to love you, and to be able to realize that there is a lamb that would be provided, who would be sacrificed, who would cover you. And then when you realize what you have done, you have an opportunity to understand, to ultimately come into that wonderful place. Until then, it's a fellowship because of the lamb that was slain. But not simply why man was placed outside because of a broken relation, broken life, a book in uh, intimacy with God, but also we ask why? Why would hands have to be pierced? You know, when you think about what Adam and Eve did, they stretched out their hand to touch the sin, the very thing that God said not to touch. And so you find a hand being pierced, Jesus taking it all. But why the feet being pierced? Again, think about it, it's uh, what would be a curse. In fact, it's the first uh, proto-evangelism also brings about a blessing and a curse, and again, talking about how important it is to touch lives. But specifically in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, it is talking about how the seed of the woman would crush the serpent's head. That's what Jesus did on the cross. But in turn, Satan would actually bruise his feet. And that is the punishment the Lord Jesus took. 
His feet was bruised by this poisonous, poisonous venom that Satan infested, which we should have taken the curse, which we should have taken all of the end writing that was against us, all of the consequences of our sin that should be placed upon us. Jesus was bruised in his feet. So when you think about all of this aspect, you come to that realization, yes, the Bible says in Deuteronomy 21, 23, we don't need to go there. Curses is he that hang it on a tree. And so when you think about what Jesus did, Galatians 3 and verse 13 says, he's made a curse who knew no curse, so we would be redeemed from the curse. And that is important. Being made a curse for us, it is written, cursed everyone that hang it on a tree. The nail, it's very difficult to imagine something like a seven inch nail, three fourth, a three eighth of a width then pierced into the hands and into the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ with Christ crucifying, crucifying. It's the very people that had said on Palm Sunday that you are Lord, you are King and now with one voice shouting, crucify him when they had an opportunity to free him because it was Barabbas. But Jesus took the place for every one of us, Barabbas. And he was hung to a tree, the nail pierced in. It was so horrible, it was so terrible. In fact, I quoted two scriptures, one that was five, a thousand years way before this really happened, when Psalm talked about it. But all of this comes to pass because these scriptures must be fulfilled, and there's a fulfillment of the scriptures. So if you were to take John chapter 19, verse 36 and 37, look what it says, for these things were done, that the scriptures should be fulfilled, a bone of him shall not be broken. Of course he would pierced, and uh, verse 37 goes on to say, and again another scripture, they shall look on him whom they pierced. Isn't that what the psalmist David said? And again, let's turn to Psalm 20, uh, 22 and verse 16. He says, towards the end, they pierced my hands and my feet. Now, 500 years before, Zechariah talks about this in Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10. Look at the words that he uses, and that is, I will pour upon the house of David, upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. And this is the latter day when the Hebrew people will realize what they, uh, the true uh, uh, people from the from the Hebrew race, they would look and they would recognize that it is their sin as well as all of us that pierced the one, and they will mourn for him as one that mourneth for his for their only son, um, God's only son, really. Again, in Zechariah chapter thirteen and verse six, five hundred years before this happened, Zechariah is saying, and one shall say unto him. What are these wounds in your hands? Then he shall answer, those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. John chapter 1 verse 11. You know, we need to understand how important this is, particularly when we look in the light of what the Lord Jesus Christ used Moses as an example, and when you turn to John chapter 3, verse 14, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up. Of course, he was put down on the cross. He had to carry that cross, and Rufus helped him. And then he was raised to the cross, and then he was nailed. And when you think of all of this, it's so tragic to realize these were all taking place according to the prophecy. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up. So the cross was lifted up. He was nailed to the cross. We need to recognize that there are many reasons why he was nailed to the cross for our punishment, for our sin. And all of this is very important. But the first thing I 
find importantly his submission. It is the nail of submission. That was the first nail. You could basically give many names, the, um, the, uh, the nail of um, sin, the nail of um, curse, so forth. But I think in terms, for the Lord Jesus Christ, it was simply a nail that speaks of, of his submission. When you turn to Philippians chapter 2 and verse 8, look what Paul is saying, talking about the Lord Jesus Christ and being found in a fashion as a man. Earlier he said, uh, though being God, uh, he didn't consider himself all of that, but he says he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. That is humility, very important. You find that. Uh, Luke chapter 22 and verse 42, uh, you find the Lord Jesus Christ saying, Father, if you will, if you be willing, remove this cup from me. It is a, cus, a, cu a cup of curse. It's a cup that would be poured unto the uh, mankind, and yet the Lord Jesus Christ drank it all. But it was a hard, difficult decision because he knew no sin, never been cursed, born sinless, as uh, come into the earth as a man, and yet divine in the celestial glory, leaving all of this, and now I have to go through this horribleness of drinking the drink of the, the, the guilt and sin and consequences. All of this is so horrible. And yet what he says, not my will, but thine be done, and submit himself because it is what he did. Very important. Number two, I find he was forsaken. He was forsaken and he was rejected of all men. And it's very important for us to understand how difficult this has been for the Lord. And in all his life, you find that rejection over and over and over again. In fact, you find not only the fact he came unto his own and his own received him not, but you find that rejection from the very first. And then at the cross, being rejected and, and basically looked aside because he had to take the whole load of our sins upon himself. That is so tragic. That is so horrible. Number three, I find, is a sense of sacrifice. And when I say a sacrifice, he becomes a sacrifice to each one of us. And that's what he did on the cross. When you think in terms of what... Uh, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7, specifically he says towards the end, for even as Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. So where do you get this picture? Going all the way back to the book of Genesis when man sinned, there has to be a lamb that sacrificed. And again, in the case of uh, a sacrificial for Isaac, a uh, lamb caught, uh, goat caught in the ticket. And then when you come to specifically into Exodus chapter 12 and verse 3, each house a lamb they were to take. And then when you come to verse 6, on the fourth day of Nishan, that would be the Good Friday that we will be celebrating, the, the, the lamb would be kept and then they shall kill it in the evening. And that basically would be the third hour or would be at 3 p.m. And that's literally what took place. So in all of this, you're going to find something very important. Jesus, he had to take the penalty of sin. It was a nail that he submitted himself to. It was a nail that he recognized he would be forsaken and was a tragic situation. When you read Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 3, look at the words of rejection. He is despised and rejected of man, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. And verse 5 is very specific. Sure, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Verse 10 goes on to say uh, in the same chapter, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He was put to, and put him to grief. That is horrible situation to go, all, to go through all of this. He never knew what is to be estranged from the Father in perfect harmony, and this becomes taken upon upon himself, the form of a man, and here, for the first time, he's on the cross saying, Father, Father my God, my God, why have you rejected me? I want you to turn to, um, this is what the psalmist says a thousand years before, Psalm 22 and verse 1. This is how the psalmist begin in this messianic psalm. 
My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? You can read the entire chapter. Every one of these verses are very important to do with the cross. And this was fulfilled when you read Matthew chapter 27 and verse 46. Look what it says in terms, and about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachani, that is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So not simply the fact a total submission to the will of the Father, not simply the fact that he was forsaken, but the fact his life was made a sacrifice, an atonement for every one of us. So when you see these nails being driven, understand very importantly, it's not simply that he's going through excruciating pain within the heart, within his own spirit, which of course Mel Gibson could not bring it. No one can film that. It's the brokenness of a, of a pure son of God taking upon himself sin and the whole uh, 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 horribleness being poured into him and being drenched with horribleness, with such gutter of sin and perversity and foolishness. Jesus took it all. But what you're going to find is beyond anything that is physical, this was the most difficult pain in the spirit and in the soul. And yet, don't get me wrong, he went through agonizing physical pain. There were many, of course, who were crucified. And crucifixion was not the norm in the Old Testament. This is a Roman thing. And yet, understand, a thousand years ago, David is writing about literally what they don't know about, but crucifixion. They nailed my hands, they nailed my feet. Zechariah is talking about it. Isaiah talks about it. How specific it could be. It's, there's no word called crucifixion until the Romans came. And so they fulfilled what the prophets had talked about. Now what the crucifixion does, it basically, you hung in the in the worst of the worst uh, hot climate. That's what the Middle East is. You're dried up. And they give you something to drink to make your pain even more agonizing. But you're put up there and what happens is for usual, people are supported by just the nails of their hand. There was no rope tied up. They went, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ went to cruel scourgings and mockery and spitting. All of that uh, which was a uh, total mockery. Not only Herod, but to Pilate, then back to Herod, back to Pilate. And Pilate realized this was a waste of time they are trying to do in the Lord Jesus because his wife had told him in a dream. But no, they were not willing. And he said, here, take Barabbas. Uh, they wanted no one but Jesus Christ and crucify him. May his blood be on us, they say. When you think about what takes place, is the feet and the hands are supporting the entire weight of the body. It goes down. And what literally happens is the lung just gets crushed into the, uh, the bones, the chest and everything gets crushed into the very lungs. And breathing is very difficult. And many a times they are left out for the animals to eat or the ravens to take. But when they are basically kept there for a while and watched over, and Jesus went through that three hours of agony, it was the most horrible scene physically, and that is what passion of the Christ portrays, every bit of it. It is gruesome, it is painful, and this is one of the most agonizing, painful death if you could ever find. But I want you to understand, it was not the nails that held Jesus. Yes, it is the nails for a lot. It was basically what hung Jesus Christ. But more than nails, I want you to understand, it was simply what the Father wanted, the will of God. And all the Lord Jesus Christ wanted to do was to do the will of the Father. So if you were to turn to John chapter 5 and verse 30, look at his open declaration. I can of mine own self do nothing as I hear I judge. And my judgment is just 
because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which had sent me. So it's very specific. The Father will that we would not perish, but we would have eternal life, and he sent his own son. But again, that is the motto, and that would be the vision or the mission statement of the Lord Jesus Christ when you turn to Luke chapter 19 and verse 10. For this reason he came that... The Son of Man came so that he could seek and to save that which was lost. And again, what held him to the very end was simply God the Father's love. John chapter 3 and verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Not simply Father's love, but Romans chapter 8 and verse 35 tells us who can separate us from the love of the Lord Jesus who can separate? And goes on to say, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Neither height, nor death, nor naked, nor so peril or persecution, and so forth, and so forth. That is how powerful it is. Something else that you find in the scripture that held him with all that excruciating pain, not simply the, the nails that held him that was pierced to his hands and on his feet, but what is so important for the joy that was before him? What joy? In the pain, he thought about you, he thought about you, he thought about me. Hebrews chapter 12 tells us, looking unto Jesus, but when you turn to Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2, it is very specific, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of God. I'll be talking, God willing, and experiences of people that had the resurrection power of the Lord Jesus, the two men on their way to Amos. But there's an unbeliever among a believer called Thomas. And he wouldn't believe because he missed a meeting. So the disciples were gathered together, and when you turn to John chapter 20 and verse 20, you find Jesus walks right in, and he had said, he showed them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. What was it? They knew that it was the Lord. They experienced him. But he's telling them the imprints on his hand and his side. Thomas would not believe. So when you turn to verse 27, the Lord appears to him. And this is the resurrected Lord. And then he said to Thomas, reach hither your finger and behold my hands. And reach either thy hand and thrust it to my side, and be not faithless, but believing. I talked about hands. Hands have to be punished. Because first man and woman touched the sin of taking that, the feet. Because the feet basically was one that was what Satan will bruise. But why the side pierce? Again, remember, when you think about Genesis chapter 2 and verse 22, man was, uh, the woman was taken from his side. And in so speaking, you find Jesus Christ is standing and taking the punishment of the one that comes from his side. Blood and water flowed. And that was ultimately what is the blood and the water, the, the blood and the spirit of God that makes the church on the Pentecost Sunday. And so he stands in the gap for the people that would be redeemed, for the people that would be blood washed, people that would be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So this is a very important resurrection. I want to say this very importantly. This is a short service for a simple reason. It is something that you're going to participate. Look at this cross. Brother Goodman was so gracious in putting this cross and nails on it. And I asked Sister Sherry to put some words on it. And if you find some words that are meaningful, you can participate in putting a nail to that. And I'll tell you why. Maybe there are blank paper, uh, paper that could simply say, no, that doesn't describe me. Maybe there's something more. And you could in your heart say, I'm nailing this to the cross of the Lord Jesus. I want you to understand how important this is because I want you to read together with me Colossians chapter 2 and verse 14. Paul says, 
what happened was blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. All that list and list and list and list of consequences of our sin. When they stretched his hand and put nail to the left hand and to the right hand. His hands were stretched out and in that stretching out the bulk of handwritings the ordinance written against us. Satan is an accuser of, of the brethren. You know, I find this so tragic. I understand this great man fell off his chair and he's fallen. But there's another guy who's a pastor. All he does is simply names people and criticizes. That is the work of the accuser of the brethren. We got to condemn wrong doctrine. But we don't have time to go around condemning pastors and preachers who fall. Be careful. We could be the next one. But for God's mercy. But there is an accuser of the brethren. That is Satan. He comes in and constantly is accusing the father. And accusing us of the sins we did. He's got a list of it. And it is I owe you. They're mine. They sinned. But the blood covers it all. And all the IOUs are cancelled. And it simply means we owe nothing to Satan. And you may remember, oh my God, I need to ask the Lord to forgive me. There's that handwriting of what I may have done. God forgive me. It may be written there, may not be written there. Nail it to the cross. Let's go back to Colossians chapter 2 and verse 14. Brotting out the handwriting of ordinance that was against us, against you, against you, against you, against every one of us and against me. That was against us, that was contrary, standing against us every day. And he took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. Nailing it to the cross. He took it out of the way and he put it on the cross. Let's take back again Galatians chapter 3 and verse 13. It simply says, he redeemed us from the curse, becoming a curse for us. So that all the next verse says, all the blessings of Abraham will come to us. Amen. Nailing it to the cross. I want you to stand up just a moment. I want you to participate in this. Brother Goodman tells me that it can hold some sort of strength. And I don't want you to go right in. Just leave it because we need the nails tomorrow, okay? But hit it just like Brother Goodman has done. And there are words, pride and lust and worry and fear and anxiety. All of this. Were you there when they crucified the Lord? Let's sing that. Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Were you there when they nailed him? Pastor Val, do you know that song? Let's sing that together. I don't know if it's going to be there. And then we will move to the cross. Were you there when they crucified him to the tree? Tremble, tremble. tremble. 